Okay, so let's talk history. I don't know if you're interested in history. I am uh, something of an uh, amateur history buff, and so let's talk history. Uh, to talk about history and to start out today, I want to, um, there will be a quiz later. I'm just kidding, there's not a quiz. It's just, I get fascinated by this stuff, and uh, we'll see. Maybe it's interesting to you, maybe it isn't. But uh, I want to talk to you about a little guy, a little, little known guy uh, who was European, uh, who lived in the, you know, into uh, the First World War, uh, lived in a place that uh, became Germany, uh, lived into the 20s and 30s, uh, went by the name of Adolf Hitler. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. Uh, he's fairly well known at this point. You know, we all kind of wish we didn't have to deal with that guy. Um, but I want to talk to you a little bit about that era and about an idea. And, and this is a little bit of how history and ideas uh, seem to work. And uh, Adolf Hitler had an idea. Um, I'm not completely sure what the overlap is. Uh, either Ford, Henry Ford idolized Hitler or Hitler idolized Henry Ford or there was a little bit of overlap. Maybe idolized is too strong of a word but they sort of uh, had some overlap of ideas. Uh, Henry Ford, it, it turns out, was pretty uh, against, uh, or, or even as far as anti-Semitic, uh, we talk about that now, uh, and he might have gotten that from, from some of his uh, interest in Hitler. Hitler got some of his ideas from uh, interest in Ford. Some of the ways that he mechanized and rebuilt Germany had to do with some of Henry Ford's ideas that he stole. One of the things that Hitler wanted to do uh, among being mechanized and weaponized and to rebuild the armies of Germany uh, it was to have a car, a people's car. Uh, and he wanted this to work the same way that Ford uh, worked his assembly line. If you worked on the assembly line, he wanted you to make enough money to be able to afford the car. He wanted this to be the car that everybody drove. It was sort of going to be mass produced and then everybody used it. And he wanted to sort of advance Germany by their access to a car, to roads, build autobahns, uh, and all these things are rooted in Hitler. Um, he really wanted this. Also, mobility through Germany would help his armies and the mechan- you know, it's all a complicated story when you get to history. But there was some overlap between Ford and Hitler, and the idea centered in wanting people to be able to get to a car, and to be able to afford a car like Ford wanted. And so, Adolf Hitler uh, met at some point and eventually hired uh, a man named Ferdinand Porsche. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of that name. Uh, Porsche is sort of that car that, you know, when you stop at the red light and someone pulls up next to you in a Porsche, it's exotic enough that you see it, right? Uh, and we know that a Porsche is a cool car and you gotta be a cool person to have that and it's expensive, it's a sports car. Uh, and so Ferdinand Porsche, who would, go, after meeting Hitler and a little later in his life, would go on to design the first Porsche that is now the legacy of that car, was the person who Hitler found to design the people's car, the Volkswagen, the people's car. And um, um, uh, the design for that uh, initially had these rounded fenders. It had this rounded uh, um, windshield, rounded car. Uh, the engine worked in a particular way. The car worked in a particular way. It had a distinct look. Uh, we know that look as the Beetle, and that was the car that Hitler wanted to be the people's car, the Volkswagen, uh, the thing ma mass-produced and used, and he hired Ferdinand Porsche to design it. Uh, as history has moved on, it turns out that the idea of what a bug, a Beetle, looks like was not actually maybe first drawn up by Porsche. He is the one that took it from the paper and turned it into a car, and there were a lot of prototypes built before they could figure out how to do this and math produce it well. Um, but they actually uh, were the initial plans of a man uh, whose last name was Ludwinka, and Ferdinand Porsche probably stole them, potentially stole them. And uh, by the way, he was Jewish, and so they didn't want to ever acknowledge that. So uh, they actually built from the idea of, of Henry Ford uh, in Germany, a whole city called Wolfsburg, Wolfsburg. Uh, and this is where the Volkswagen, uh, the people's car was gonna be, there was a factory built there, this is where it was gonna be built. Uh, and so post-war, after Hitler and after Porsche was out of Volkswagen and, and some of this other stuff had moved on, 
this Wolf, Wolfsburg, Wolfsburg was in the section of Germany that was in the, the uh, um, British quadrant when it was all broken up after the war. And the British wanted to help re-jump the economy of Europe, and especially Germany. They wanted to help them heal by uh, re-establishing the people's car. And so they kept this idea, and they sort of renewed it. Um, the U.S. wanted to help with this economy. Uh, we eventually began to import those cars to the United States once the mass production after the war uh, proved okay. It became a real trend thing in the United States. Uh, they had some really famous uh, uh, advertising campaigns, Think Small. Well, you know, this was the time when, when Detroit was making, uh, in Ford's model, was making big chrome boats. And here's this little, not very chrome, uh, simple car that didn't even always run real well. And uh, they started to market it. It built this up. Uh, this became a hippie car into the 60s. Like, hippies wanted these things uh, and drove these things. And now, like, Volkswagens are still around. And uh, I would say, it's, you know, a sort of distinct kind of people maybe who still drive those. All of that has to do with one idea morphing and growing and changing. Some of those are sudden stops, like discontinuous with the past, but kind of building, but always building off of it. Uh, the idea of, of a thought that grows into a whole movement or a whole brand or a whole story. That is the idea of the sermon this Sunday, and that is the idea of preparing for Sunday where we are uh, today. This is preparing for Sunday. Good morning, good afternoon. This isn't really a history lesson on Volkswagen. This is a preparing for Sunday. This is where you and I take a look together at the upcoming Sunday scripture text. This is for Sunday, December 10th, 2023. And this is for Advent, uh, week two of year B. So what that means is, is that we have just recently switched over from Matthew, which is year A in the lectionary, to year B. Uh, so we've gone from Matthew now to Mark. We're in the second week of Mark. The first week of the lectionary always harkens back to the year before it. it, it it's linked. It's an idea that's built. And so it starts like the year ends with apocalyptic literature. Last week we were in Mark 13. The skies are going to fall and stay awake and disaster is going to befall you. And that was last week's scripture and that's always an Advent 1 reading. This week we finally get to get to sort of the beginning of a new book. So we're finally to the beginning of Mark. And it's Mark chapter 1 verses 1 through 8. Whether you use this as a thing that you sit down with and watch, I mean, nothing's really that exciting happening here, but if you're watching this, uh, you know, and you're able, this is where I suggest pausing, uh, taking out your Bible, looking up the first chapter of Mark and reading it for yourself before I go into it a little further um, and see what you make of it. Um, we're in Mark 1, 1 through 8, week 2 of Advent, and now we get to the beginning of Mark. Uh, so we're at Mark 1, 1 through 8. And uh, um, I want to look specifically with verse 1 with you for a little bit. And I want to think about ideas and how they're advanced, how they grow. The sermon is going to be about the exact same thing, uh, about, about an idea uh, that takes root and changes things. And that's uh, all built off of where we are in Mark, really. Um, uh, Mark 1, 1 through 8 proves that Mark is the first maybe the biggest Scrooge of all time. He's Ebenezer Scrooge, he's the Grinch, he's all those characters in those Hallmark movies that just don't like Christmas. What I mean is, is Mark must not like Christmas because the, the book starts at the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, and then it goes right into John the Baptist and to Jesus' baptism in the wilderness. There's no Christmas story here. Um, that does not mean that Mark isn't working with the old ancient story of the Bible and God at work in the world and centering that into Jesus. It means that he's doing that differently. And he does it by dropping it like a bombshell right in your midst. It's still the idea of a Jewish uh, Messiah, but it's, it's, it's not rooted in, well, here's how God showed up. Let me give you a little bit of background. Matthew starts with a genealogy of how Jesus is connected to the past. Mark is just like, I'm taking this idea of Jesus saving us 
and I'm just dropping it right here, like a brand new idea, right? In all of history, our ideas that develop and grow and, and grow branches and change and have effect, and this is another idea, and it starts right here in Mark, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Those first couple of words are the beginning, and that's hearkening all the way back to Genesis in the beginning. There's no need to, in Mark's mind to tell you about Gloria and the shepherds and the wise people, magi, and the no room in the inn. There's no need for all that uh, because uh, Mark is trying to tell uh, like, like maybe that post-war story of the beetle that like, we're not going to associate this with that thing anymore. It's kind of always connected, but it's kind of going to be a new thing. That's what Mark is going to kind of do the beginning, the beginning. So when a thing begins, it's now different than that thing it was before. Uh, when your kid is born, uh, they're not something that's ever existed before, right? They're, it's the beginning of their life, their, their, their beginning. Uh, I'm currently reading, uh, I read a, a book about the life and times of Dietrich Bonhoeffer a few weeks ago, uh, which is a recommend, by the way. Uh, the book is called Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, pastor, prophet, martyr, spy, um, and it's by Eric Metaxas, and I recommend it. Um, but it's led me to return to some things I've read before that were things that Bonhoeffer actually wrote, theological uh, lectures or books. Or And so I'm currently reading um, uh, Creation in the Fall, which was written by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. It's a short little treatise, and uh, he starts there in the beginning by saying, um, you know, when God created, uh, God spoke, and it becomes this new thing that hadn't existed before. And we don't get in Genesis an explanation for why God even wanted to create. We just get that God did it. And that's what we get here in Mark. We don't get an explanation, per se, of why God wants to send Jesus. We just get Jesus comes, right? And it's sort of an old idea made new, but it's also sort of different than, than the way this has been delivered before. So there's a lot going on just in the first few words here. Then it says, of the good news. It's the beginning of what? Of the good news. And that is a loaded, 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 one word in Greek, two words in English, good news. The Greek word is evangelion, a well-known Greek word. Uh, you can see it from a mile away when you when you look at Greek text, texts. Um, uh, evangelion. That word means good news, but it has a significance in Mark's world, and it has a completely different significance in our world. This is an idea uh, that has transformed and changed and be renewed. It, it's still in our world. It got dropped, and then it still exists, but it has morphed a lot over the years. Um, so to Mark's world, uh, Evangelion existed before Mark said the beginning of the story of Jesus. He's stealing that word from somewhere. Uh, where it's used in Mark's world is by uh, the, the Roman people. This was the way that they, remember there were no newspapers or internet back then, or phone calls. This is the way they announced a great victory. Rome has won a great victory in the far off land of X. And this is the Evangelion of that victory. And then they give like a newsreel of it and it would be announced off of a scroll. The good news. Uh, so people would throw uh, parades and would honor their, you know, their heroes. And that's the word Mark is stealing, this good news. For us, he's stealing it and flipping it around because the good news of Jesus is that Jesus is God and God is gonna die and not just die, but have to be brought back to life. So he's flipping around already this idea of, in a world that he lives in and applying it to God's new beginning and how God is at work. And so he's taking an idea and he's flipping it around onto its head because he's not saying it the way that the world he lives in would say it. That would get people's attention. It's a play on words or a play on some ideas. Um, into our world, this word evangelion still exists. It still exists for you and I. The people of St. Stephen Evangelical Lutheran Church, evangelical, is from evangelion. 
Uh, it still exists when we have um, the moral majority, the evangelicals, the votes, and those people even translate this word differently. Uh, the ELCA uses the word evangelical different than the moral majority does. Uh, but it's still this idea, and it's morphed, and it's moved around. Um, uh, Mark is uplifting it from a political purpose in his world, and saying Jesus does this new thing and operates in this way, where he, he heals, dies, is resurrected. When the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, St. Stephen Evangelical, uses that word, what we mean is we're based in that story. The belief in scripture, the belief in death, the belief in only God can breathe new life where, where dying sinful people are, are existent. Um, when the moral majority uses that word evangelical, they're using it closer, not all the way back, but closer to the way Rome used it. Uh, they're using it as a sort of political nomenclature that identifies you as a group and they tend to believe uh, um, a very sort of a uniform system of belief and they're evangelicals and they have a certain way of uh, sharing the story of Jesus. Um, and it's, uh, even though Lutherans use that word too, we use it in two completely different ways, just like how Mark uses that in a different way than Rome. And just like, you know, the word Volkswagen means something different now than it meant in 1935 in Germany or even 1950 in Germany, or even 1960 in the United States. Here's all these old ideas who, that are seeds in time, and they change and grow and are blown by the wind. And, uh, you know, it takes a lot of uh, story understanding. It's, it, it takes a lot of uh, knowledge of who God is to see how the story has morphed and changed and where God's been at work. And there's part of it. So that's this first part, the beginning of the good news. And then it says, of Jesus Christ, of Jesus who's the Messiah. That means one thing for Jewish people. That means a different thing for Gentile people. And Mark is written mostly for Gentiles. They would not really have as much of a vested interest in a Messiah. And so he needs to say, well, here's why you need to have a vested interest in that. A Matthew, for example, has rootedness in what a Messiah is supposed to look like according to the Old Testament. Mark doesn't really have that. Uh, Mark uh, is much more trying to convince you that you need a Messiah, a Christ, uh, a christened one, uh, one like a king that's been designated by God as God's chosen. Uh, in the Old Testament, the prophets are uh, messianic. They are christened. They are the ones who bear the message. And so Jesus, in his flesh and blood, uh, is God bearing the message. And so this is, in one verse, Mark trying to drop a ton of theology uh, or, or, and morph some ideas, but also let it be the beginning of a brand new thing, a surprise, God at work. And then we get, at the end of that verse, chapter 1, verse 1, do we get, of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Interesting part of the Son of God is that the oldest manuscripts of Mark, the ancient, the earliest ones written, do not have the Son of God in it. Um, uh, these were added later. Gentiles would have no problem with this idea, son of God, uh, because they know of Hercules, who's the son of Zeus, and they know they have uh, they have uh, stories that exist like this. But Mark is trying to say that to be the son of God is different than you think, and so in some ways, what Mark is doing is taking an old idea and making it new again, taking uh, a new idea and making it old again. It's this sort of in the beginning, and it drops this surprising story right in front of you. And uh, that's what Mark is about to do with this. He doesn't want to give you an easy entryway into it with the birth stories. He wants you to be hit right over the head of who, who, who we are because God entered our time. Um, and then we're going to go right into the story of John the Baptist. Advent 2 and 3 are always John the Baptist weeks. But same thing in John the Baptist is what I've been talking about. John the Baptist is a person who takes an idea and is innovated with it, advances it. And then Jesus takes up what John the Baptist is innovated with and, and advances and, and takes it infinitely further. And so what we're thinking about with Mark is uh, an old idea that's new again, a new idea that's old again, uh, Christmas. 
um, you know, like, that's an old idea. We've been doing Christmases every December 25th of our lives. Every December 25th of my life and your life has been Christmas and we've always celebrated it, but it hasn't always been the same. And that idea of what it looks like decoratively, uh, um, personally, what it means with your family, that's changed over time. And, and it, 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 the idea with Mark is, is that God is the, the, the author of this narrative. And it is going to take this whole new, different story in a new, new, new way um, but it's also the old story, and, and you're going to see things here that are like, yeah, I remember that. Um, the, and so that's how Mark is introducing uh, Mark's story of who Jesus is. And it begins here with John the Baptist, no Christmas story. And uh, this is a uh, surprising thing. And then through the rest of this week's reading, we're going to get the idea that God shows up not in Jerusalem, but out in the middle of the wilderness which would blow people's mind. Like if you're gonna, if you're gonna be the son of God, you, you, normally you would wanna show up in a, in a cool, in where the cool people would wanna be. Why do you wanna be out where no one ever cool would ever be? Because this story, this good news, this evangelion is different. It's the same idea, but it's redeeming it. It's fixing it. It's adjusting the way the old idea has morphed into something broken and it's fixing, it's breathing new life into it. It's trying to surprise you. It's trying to take that old thing and change it for the better. And, and uh, we do get in here some also some stories of uh, baptism and ritual washings. Um, ritual washings uh, in the ancient world have to do with being clean before you sit in with other people, uh, which have to do with uh, not spreading illness uh, you know, when you eat. Uh, it's the same thing in post-COVID when we want to hand sanitize or wash our hands before we eat dinner. Um, uh, ritual washings. But, but in terms of baptism, it's made significant in that it's given a lot of uh, theological or, or God story import. And that it's not just a normal routine washing of hands. That idea is great, but we're going to make it greater still. And so this week's sermon deals a lot with ideas and how they grow. And it's also going to ask you, uh, when we gather together, to think of an idea. And, and I'm going to go further into this as a Christmas present to somebody. Uh, to come up with an idea that's a Christmas present for somebody. And I'll explain more of what I mean with that on Sunday. Um, this idea, though, of, of uh, a story that never ends and just keeps developing uh, and changing that's what's going on with Mark, but it's also a fun new thing. Uh, yes, we have sat down for Christmas every December 25th of our lives, but you and I have never had December 25th, 2023. This is going to be a new thing, and God's going to do something different this year. Uh, and, and yes, it looks the same in some ways. Yes, though, it's different. Uh, in the midst of the same, different, uh, are you a person who... Uh, just sort of blows through it? Or are you going to sit back and say, boy, God must be up to something here. And here's what it is. And, and, and here's what it's doing to me. And I'm so thankful for that. Um, that's the story of Mark. And uh, it has a lot to do with uh, an old story being made new. There's some idea of having to repent, to have to shift gears in order for this idea to really take hold in you. In order for us to to uh, see God, it, it's a gear shift, it's a repentance, it's a discontinuous change from the day of yesterday to today. And now God is doing a new thing, and uh, most of us are not willing to do that. We want all the old things, and, and we want to all the old grudges, and we don't want to repent, and we don't want to be surprised. Um, but if you want God, and you want God's beginning, it means uh, letting God be God, and faithfully um, sitting before God and saying, no, if God's up to a new thing, uh, please God help me see it and be patient and understanding of what you're doing. It's a different tact than being like, no, I won't change, no, I won't. And so what Mark really wants to tell us, especially at Advent, is that when God shows up, the, the idea, the story is brand new, it's a beginning. And its beginning is in Mark, but it's also for you and I. And a new beginning in 2023 
up. Who knows what it's going to look like. Uh, but we should be open to God speaking, doing, acting, resurrection in our lives of dead sinfulness. Uh, if we really want to uh, be God's uh, disciples and children, that's what we should be looking for. So that's what uh, this text is about. And uh, I've sort of given you a history lesson and a theology lesson and some uh, insight into especially Mark 1.1. 1, 1. Uh, I would invite you to read that for yourself to, to see what you think that has to say. And then we'll gather for worship uh, this upcoming Sunday, December 10th at 9.30. It'll be the second week of Advent. And we will continue our uh, Given Tree, Jesse Tree uh, process. But we're going to think about how ideas change and the power of ideas. The power of John the Baptist pronouncing an idea and then Jesus being able to come on the heels of that idea, God, and doing amazing things with it. So that's where we're at. That's where Mark's at. And uh, I appreciate that you join me. And uh, hopefully I will see you Sunday where we will look closer at this text again. All right, see you then. Between now and then, enjoy the season. Stay safe. I will see you soon.